Okay, so in this video we're going to take a look at refraction and actually taking a look at refraction at an angle. So we don't need too many things for this. We need ourselves a ray box with a slit in it. Um, that will give us a nice beam of light when we turn it on. So you can see there. We've got a semicircular block, uh, a protractor, a ruler, and a pen, pencil, something like that. And then we should be good to go. So first thing I'm going to do is choose a position for my semicircular block. And I'm just going to draw around it. So I can always put this back later on if I need to. That's all, friend. Okay, so we've got that there. Then what we're going to do is turn on our ray box. And what we're trying to do is get it so that the light doesn't change direction at this first boundary. So it requires a little bit of fiddling, a little bit of try and error. But I think I've pretty much got it there. So our light goes straight through here. And it does that because it's traveling along the normal to the boundary. And so what we get is our light gets to this boundary here. And you can see it bends or it's refracted along here. So we're interested in the refraction occurring at this boundary along here. So as with any optical experiment, what we need to do is draw ourselves a normal line. There we go. Got ourselves a normal line there. And then we can put, and actually, I was being a bit careless, I should make sure my normal line extends on both sides because I'm going to need to measure angles on both sides. Okay, so there we go. So we've got our light going straight through the first boundary. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark with a little X where it's entering the glass block, because that will then allow us to measure what the angle of incidence is. What I'm also going to do with a little X, I'm actually going to do two little angle X's on each side. So what we've done is marked where the ray goes. So we can now turn our system off, take our glass block away, and we can actually draw a ray diagram for what the ray is doing using our little X's. Okay, so this here, so this over here is what we'd call our incident beam. This here is what we'd call our refracted beam. So we want to measure the angle of um, incidence and the angle of refraction, which are always measured to the normal. So we want to measure this angle in here and this angle in here. So let's do that. And then we can uh, make ourselves a little table up here at the top. Um, so I'm going to have I and I'm going to have R. I'm also going to have sine i and I'm going to have sine r and we'll uh, look at why we're doing that a little bit later on. Okay so first angle of incidence so that to me looks like what's that 37 degrees okay angle of refraction Okay, and then that is, what's that, 68 degrees, I reckon. So you can see that when we're going from glass into air, we can see it's what we call bending away from the normal. So the angle of refraction is bigger than the angle of incidence there. Okay, so we'll, do, we'll deal with the signs and stuff in a second. What we're going to do is take another measurement here at a different angle of incidence. So let's get our stuff back. Okay, that's lined up pretty good. So we're aiming for exactly the same thing. We want the light ray going straight through the first boundary, uh, but ending up at exactly the same spot um, on this side here. So I reckon let's do an X, put an X. You know, oh, hmm, that's interesting. Our light ray isn't being refracted anymore. We've got it being reflected. That's interesting. So this is a process called total internal reflection, which we'll look at in a later video. So what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to change my angle of incidence and go the other way. So I made my angle of incidence bigger. Let's actually make it smaller. Instead, I'm going to have to adjust my camera so I can fit it. 
So let's do a nice small angle of incidence this time. Okay, so let's mark our points. And then that goes along here. And the same process, exactly the same thing. All we're going to do, draw our angle of incidence and our angle of fraction. So we need that angle and that angle, which we can measure again. Very simple. You can see that is 20 degrees. Uh, this one is just under 30, so that's 29 degrees. So you can see that the angle of fraction is still bigger than the angle of incidence, so that will still um, hold there. And let's do one final one. Uh, I'll stick one somewhere in between those two. I reckon that'll do it pretty good. Again, marking our locations. That's easy. And this time our angle of incidence is ooh, bang on 30 degrees. That's nice. Very satisfying. Uh, our angle of refraction, so it's this one over here, uh, is 50 degrees. So you can see our angle of refraction is still bigger than our angle of incidence. Now, I'm going to skip a step out here. So what we'd often do is we'd plot a graph of I against R. And we notice it's weirdly shaped, so it doesn't really tell us anything useful. But the, the interesting thing about this experiment is what happens if we plot a graph of sine i against sine r. And to do that, we're first going to need to calculate what those are. So I'll grab my calculator so we can do that. OK, so let's do our calculations with that. So what we're going to do is to do sine of things uh, you first have to check that there's a little D up in here. This tells, your tells you your calculator is working in degrees. Um, most of you it should, because you probably haven't come across radians yet, but it's always worth checking. So we're going to do sine 37. That's what, 0 0.60. Sine of 68.93. Sine of 20. Four. Sine of 30 is a half exactly, which is always nice. Sine of 29 is basically going to be just under a half. And then sine of 50, uh, that's not 0.77. So immediately having calculated these things, there's nothing obvious from looking at them. So the interesting thing will be what it looks like if we plot a graph of these. So. Um, to show you what that would look like, if we had a, a small sketch here, so if we had sine i against sine r, what that would look like is this. So it would be a straight line passing through the origin. So uh, that's all very nice, um, but um, what if we don't want to plot a graph? How can we tell the graph would look like th this graph without actually doing that? So I'll keep the table here so we can refer to that in a second. Okay, so we've got our data there. So what I'm going to do is do something that shows its direct proportional relationship without actually plotting a graph, which is nice. So essentially, if directly proportional, what we'd find is that sine i over sine r is a constant. So we get the same value when we do that. Now we could have done sine r over sine i, that would be fine, it wouldn't make any difference. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to try that out using the data I've got. So uh, for our first set of data, sine i is 0.6, sine r is 0.3. I'll write out my working for um, the next few as well and then I'll just do all the calculations on the go. So the next one is 0.34, 0.48, and then the next one is 0 0.50, 0 0.77. And I'm going to calculate what each of these are. So let's actually do that first of all. So 0 0.6 divided so by 0.93. Calculator outputs a fraction, but I want a decimal. So that's 0 0.64. 0 0.65. 0 0.66. 0 0.67. 0 0.68. 0 0.69. 0 0.70. 0 0.71. 0 0.72. 0 0.73. 0 0.74. 0 0.75. 0 0.76. 0
0 0.34 divided by 0 0.48. Uh, 0.71 and then 0.5 divided by 0 0.77 0 0.65 so what I'm looking at these is I'm looking at these and they're saying it's constant within experimental uncertainty so we're never going to get exactly the same value here but the value we've got they're all really close together so what that tells me is it is indeed a directly proportional relationship because this sine of, of a sine r is the same value all the time so just to what i'm going to do is calculate an average of those so 0 0.64 plus 0.71 plus 0 0.65 divided by 3 so it's 0.66. So what this allows us to do is actually generate an equation linking the two. So what you see here is that generally sine i divided by sine r is equal to 0.6. Uh, this was actually 0.6 recurring, so that should be a 7. So I'm thinking about it carefully. And we get ourselves an equation. And what that means is we could do put any angle of incidence we like, and we can then calculate what the angle of refraction would be using this equation. So that's why we want this equation. That's why it's useful. We can predict any angle of refraction from our angle of incidence. Um, so this will work specifically if we're going from glass into air. And we'll see later on what this 0.67 represents um, in terms of refractive index. But essentially, this is what our equation, our experiment has shown us. Going from glass into air, we can predict angle of refraction based on that angle of incidence.